Well, good morning. Good morning. And uh, it's great to be here. How many of you, this is your first time at Chahi Summer School of Music? All right. Well, I am so excited for you. Um, I hate to say this, but 17 years ago, I know, I see the faces. I sat where you sat as a first-time camper. So, yes, I am older than I look. Uh, at least I like to think that. Um, but I am excited because, as, as Randy just shared, uh, I came here, my sister had come, and she talked about it and talked about it, and I just wasn't sure that I wanted to give up part of my summer to go to music camp. But then she told me that there were usually a lot more girls there than there were guys. <laughs> and I thought, maybe, maybe I should just check out this camp. So, uh, and so I planned to go for two weeks, and I came, and after about three days, I called home, and I said, can I stay for two more weeks? And my parents allowed that to happen. And as Randy shared, uh, God really did radically change my life when I came here as a camper. Um, and I'll be sharing a little bit about that throughout the week, but uh, I'm so grateful and thankful for this ministry. Uh, because I, I don't think I would be where I am today and doing what I am today without Chahi Summer School of Music. So I'll be forever grateful. And it's uh, just an incredible privilege to be able to come back here uh, and be part of this ministry and to share in your lives. I look forward to getting to know those of you that are new and I don't know yet. I uh, look forward to learning where you're from, your names. I'll try my best and uh, hearing your stories. And uh, just looking forward to spending the week with you. If there's any way that I can encourage you or help you in your walk with Christ, uh, please let me know. Um, uh, for you that know me, last year when I was here at camp, I knew something that I couldn't tell you yet, uh, and that was that my wife was pregnant uh, just uh, a few weeks into it with our second child, and in January, see if I can get this to work right, we had a little boy born, so his name is Evan Daniel, and uh, he's, he is a great little baby, and uh, this is another picture of him, so <laughs> he, he may not... Uh, he may not forgive me for showing that, but um, that's Evan. And then I have a little girl as well. She's two and a half. Lena jo well, actually, she'll be three in August, so she's no longer two and a half. And that's Evan there. And that's my little girl. She is a precocious little two-year-old. She is already planning her wedding. Um, <laughs> Uh, the other day at breakfast, uh, she went into the details of what was going to be served at her wedding, how big the dance floor was going to be. So she's not Baptist, I guess. And, <laughs> and uh, she also talked about how the train, uh, the, the train of her dress. So she is uh, excited. That was a wedding we were at a few weeks ago. But her name's Lena Joy, and she really is my special little friend. Uh, we have a good time together. If you are friends with me and you're on Facebook, you uh, see all my annoying posts about her. That's my little guy. So I, my little girl, I call her Lena Bug. That's her nickname. And sometimes they just call her Bug, which when we're out places and I call her Bug and she comes, people kind of look at me funny. But we call, it, we call him Buddy Bear, so that's his name. So I miss them, so you guys are going to have to fill in for my kids this week and, and be my kids this week. So anyway, this week, my deepest desire and my greatest prayer is that God would do for you what he did for me when I was here. And my desire for you this week, or however long you're here, some of you are two weeks, three weeks, some of you, how many of you are here for five weeks? All right, that's awesome. All right, counselors, yes, I know you're here for five weeks. <laughs> it's my prayer, it's my desire that, that while you're here, that you will see God for who he is, and that you'll see your life the way God sees it. And that's really my, my greatest desire, my greatest prayer for each of you. Because I believe that when you see God for who He is, and when you see your life the way God sees it, it will change the way that you live. Uh, I have a verse that I really want to kind of be our, our theme verse for the week. And uh, it comes from Ephesians. Oh, oh, oh. Your theme verse? Oh, got ahead of myself. All right. That is my wife, and that does fit in with my message. So let me back up. Um, our theme verse for the week, and we'll get to the slide in just a moment. I'm going to try to back up. There we go. Is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke this morning, but if you want to look real quickly at Ephesians chapter 4, it's going to be our theme verse for the week. And there, in Paul, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, he spent the first three chapters really laying out some basics of who they were in Christ and some doctrine. And then in the second half, he moves into application. And this is what he says, based on what... God has done for us. He says this. He says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. And really that's what I want to challenge you with this week. To lead a life that's worthy of the calling that you've been called to by God. Now, 
The reason I have that picture there isn't just to show off my, my beautiful wife. And a little later in the week, I will, for you that are returning campers, you expect this, I will show you the picture of what I look like when I was a camper, all right, which will make this picture seem uh, all the more miraculous, all right? <laughs> so guys, there is hope for you. Um, but when I first saw my wife, uh, I was in graduate school. It was 2002. Most of you were just running around as little kids then. When I saw her, it changed everything. I noticed her, we were in a student leadership meeting and that I was helping oversee, and I saw someone there that I never saw before, and I said to the guy I worked with, I said, who is that? I need to meet her. And uh, if you want to hear the long story, you can ask me sometime, I'll share it with you, but uh, long story short, we did end up getting married. But when I saw her, it changed everything. And I believe when you see God for who He is, it will change everything. You see, I believe when you truly see God for who He is and you truly understand how He views your life and how He looks at you, I believe it will change the way that you live. You see, when I saw the woman I wanted to marry, I really didn't want to marry anybody else. Now, it was a long story. I ended up dating somebody else, so you can ask me about that. <laughs> but I knew that it had changed everything. And I believe when you see God for who He is, it will change everything. Our theme verse, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 1, I want to share each message, I have a word for each message, and they all begin with the letter D, because I believe D is the best letter in the alphabet. Anybody else with me? All right. Three of you. Great. Well, when your name's Dan Davis, you like the letter D. So each week, we're gonna have a, each, week each day, we're going to have a word for you, begins with the letter D. So today, our word is definition. And what comes to your mind when you hear the word definition? Yes. Dictionary. dictionary, all right. Yes, that's what we, most of us think of. And if you would go to the dictionary and look up the word definition, like most English words, you'll find that it has more than one. But the one that I want us to focus on this morning is this. An exact meaning or exact statement or description of the nature, scope, or meaning of something. And really this morning, I want you to challenge you to see how do you define your life? How do you define your life. We, we all define the way we live, and the way that we define ourselves will change the way that we live. How you choose to see yourself will affect how you live and function. And one of the things that happened to me when I came here was I began to see God for who He was. It was at one of our bonfires, I believe, that Randy uh, said something to the effect of, how big is your God? And he challenged us to see God for who he was and to see how great he was. And when I began to see God for who he was, my life began to look different because I realized God had called me to live different. But I think a lot of times we don't tend to define our lives necessarily by that. But sometimes we define ourselves, ourselves by how we look. All right, how many of you have ever known someone or maybe you yourself say, we define ourselves by how we look? Maybe we define ourselves by our athletic ability, or for some of us, our athletic inability. Maybe you define yourself by the instrument you play. All right? If you're a trumpet player, that's a good thing. <laughs> All, right. All right. Perfect reaction. Man. All right. Sometimes we define ourselves by the clothes we wear, our spiritual beliefs. Maybe your theological systems, your denomination, you say, I'm this or I'm that. Maybe it's your relationship status that you define yourself by. Maybe it's your political ideologies. Now, these things, most of them, they're not good or bad. They're, 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 a lot of them are, are really neutral. But I think all of them really fail. I did it again. They really fail to define us for who we are. So that really leads to this question, how do and how should we define our lives. And I believe it really comes down to seeing God for who He is and seeing your life the way God sees it. And so that's my goal for you this week. And I know, I don't know what button I keep pressing, but I keep pressing it. To see your life as God sees it. I really, I know I've repeated that like four times already, and I did so very, very intentionally because I want that thought to permeate your hearts and your minds today. So if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 15. I want us to go to a very familiar story, a parable that Jesus told. Most of you will be really well acquainted with this story. And there are a lot of things that we can learn from this. There are a lot of applications from this parable that Jesus taught. But I really believe that this parable helps us to see God as He wants us to see 
him, and it helps us to see our lives as he sees them. And so, Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, is of course the story that we call the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the lost son. And I just want us to kind of take a journey through this parable. I know it's familiar to many of you, but maybe for some of you it's not. But let's just take a fresh look at it this morning, and then I want to draw some applications to how it can change the way that we look at our lives. It says this, Jesus said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Now, we want to stop there and think about what just happened. In this culture and in this time, it was permissible to do this. But it was very unloving and very unkind. Basically, this son is going to his dad and said, Dad, I wish you were dead. I don't want anything to do with you. I want my inheritance and I want to get out. And so the son comes and he's, he's, he's very rebellious in his heart. He says, Dad, I want, my, I want what's coming to me. He's the younger son. That means he gets one-third of his father's estate. His older brother would have gotten two-thirds. How many of you are, are a younger brother and think that's unfair? All right. That's how it worked. <laughs> Verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. So he, he takes off. He goes as far away from home as he can get, as far away from the father as possible. And there he lives a wild, a sinful life, and he wastes all of his money. It says in verse 13, not many days later, the younger son, uh, we read about verse 13, look at verse 14. After he spent everything, a severe famine struck the country and he had nothing. So then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him out into the fields to feed pigs. Which is ironic, Jewish people would not eat pig, they did not eat pork. And there he is feeding pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the carob pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything to eat. And so here we see the story of this young man, rebellious. He goes to his dad. He says, Dad, I wish you were dead. Dad, I want your money. He takes off. He wastes it. He ends up far from where he intended and expected to be. I'm sure when he left home, he never thought he'd end up in a pig pen, starving. But there he was. And it says this, when he came to his senses, verse 17, he said this, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food? And yet here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up and he went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and he threw his arms around his son and his, around his neck, and he kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, it's a pretty amazing exchange. He's there feeding the pigs, and one day he says, you know what? He said, I'd be better off just to go back to dad, tell him that I've sinned, admit it, and ask to be a servant. I know it won't be the same anymore. I, I know everything will have changed. Our relationship's broken now. I, I went to him and told him I wished he was dead. You know, I took all his money and I wasted it. When I go back, it's not going to be the same. But maybe, just maybe, he says, my dad was a good man. Maybe he'll let me be one of the servants. And at least I'll have a place to sleep and I'll have something to eat. He was starting to realize the depth of his problem, but he still didn't realize the real solution. He was still trying to figure out how he could do something about it. But he was going in the right direction. And then something really amazing happens. Look at what, what happens. Not only had the father run to him and give him a hug, but listen to what he does. Verse 22, it says, But the father told his slaves, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He is lost and now he, he was lost, and now he is found. And so they began to celebrate. Of course, this story is a parable, which meaning it's a story that Jesus told because it wasn't just about a son coming home to his father. It was a story designed to teach the crowd that he was speaking to about God and about us. There were two 
main audiences in the crowd that day. There were people who knew that they were sinners and knew that they were far from God, and there were people there who thought they were close to God, who were very religious. They were called Pharisees. And they were both listening to this story, to this parable. And Jesus was wanting them to understand the heart of his Father and their condition and their need. The father, of course, represents God. The younger son is a rebellious son. We're going to get to the older brother in just a moment. He is a religious son. Look at, look at his story. It says, Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. They were not Baptists, obviously. <laughs> music and dancing? <coughs> pastor at a Baptist church, so I'm allowed to make Baptist jokes, <laughs> in case you were wondering. All right. So he summoned his servant, and he asked what these things meant. He said, your brother is here, and your father slaughtered the fattened calf because he came back safe and sound. Then he became angry, and he didn't want to go in, so his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. How many of you think that might be a wee bit of an exaggeration? Mm. All right. But in his mind, he's, he's been a good son. And he probably has on the outside. He probably is a pretty good son. He probably has been mostly obedient. He says, but you never even gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes... You slaughtered, when he came home, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. And the father said, son, you were always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead. He's alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. There's the father who represents God. There's the younger brother, the rebellious one, the prodigal one who ran away. But then there's the older brother who was religious but far from his father. And I want you to see an amazing thing about God through this story. Because the Father representing God does two incredibly gracious things in this story. First of all, He's very gracious to the younger son, isn't He? Extremely gracious. Here's how gracious He is. Men in this culture did not run. If you were a, a, a wealthy man as this man is portrayed to be, who has a great assets, who has servants, you did not run in public because it was undignified. And yet here we find that he was out watching and waiting. He was looking for that son of his to come home. And when he sees him coming, filthy and nasty and destitute, he runs to him and he wraps his arms around that son. And Jesus was trying to help you and I and this audience here understand how greatly he loves you and how greatly he is ready and willing and able to forgive you of your sin when you come to him. Because his life really is a picture of all of our lives. And even though we are pretty good sometimes at covering up our mess and hiding our sin, our lives, our sin is portrayed by this son. The Bible says that we have all gone our own way. That all of us have rebelled against God. That all of us have sinned. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says all of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed God's standard. But there's a God in heaven who gave his son. You see, because there's a third son in this story. It's the Son of God who told the story. And Jesus came. He died on a cross for your sin, for my sin. He rose from the dead. And because he paid the penalty for your sin, the Father is ready and willing and able to forgive you, to set you free, to make you his child. This son, he was coming home. He thought, if I could just, just be a slave. And his father said, no, no, you're my son. And he did very, three very significant things. He, he put a robe on him. And the robe didn't, wasn't just new clothes. A robe meant he had an identity as a son. The robe was saying, I am accepting you back as a son. A slave or a servant would not wear this sort of robe. Only an honored son could wear the robe of his father. It was a mark of distinction and privilege. And so when he put that robe on, he says, I want you to see your identity as my son. You're not a slave. You're not a servant. You're my son. And when God says, I want you to understand how greatly I love you. I want you to understand how great I am. And I want you to look at your life the way I see it. And although you've sinned and although you've messed up, 
I am ready and willing and able to forgive you and to love you. And this morning, I want you to know that even though God is holy, and He is, He dwells in unapproachable perfection and glory. He created man in his own image, but we rebelled against God. You know the story about Adam and Eve, how they sinned and they brought sin into the presence of mankind. And ever since, we've all had rebellious hearts. We've all gone our own way. But even though we were unholy, even though we were separated from God, he's chosen to pursue us with his love and his mercy and his grace. And so many people today believe that they can connect to God through their own effort. And I really think the older brother pictures that. See, so he said, I, I've always been here, I've worked hard, I've done everything you said. He said, he said I follow the rules, I've done all the things I should do. But his heart wasn't right. Because he didn't realize his own need to go to his father. And he find forgiveness and grace and mercy. The father did something very, very gracious for the older brother. He went outside during the party. This would not have been done. This was unacceptable in the culture. It was very rude of the older brother because his job was to host the party and yet he refused. And yet the father goes out to him graciously and pleads and invites him to come in as well. And so this morning I want you to realize how greatly God loves you. I want you to see God for who he is. He is high. He is holy. He dwells in unapproachable light. He dwells in glory and perfection but he sent his son to bridge the uncrossable barrier that exists between man and God. You see, there's no way that you and I can work our way towards God. We can't be good enough to earn God's favor. We can't be good enough to earn God's forgiveness. We can't be good enough to earn His acceptance. We have to realize that we can only find that when we come to Him and realize that He has to give us something that we don't deserve. And I want you to see this morning that He is ready, He is willing, He is able to give you that. And when you come to God, your life and your destiny are changed forever. This son, when he came home and got that robe and he got that ring and those sandals, his life was changed forever. And your relationship with God is to be the defining characteristic of your life. I want for you to define your life not by the temporary things of this world and not by the, the temporary things that we can, but rather say, I am a follower of Christ. I am a child of God. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2 says. It says, But God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's an amazing picture of what God has done for you. That's who you are if you know Christ as your Savior. And then he says this. This was our theme verse a few years ago if you were here. Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we could do the good things he planned for us long ago. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And it begins by seeing him for who he is and seeing your life as he sees it. And I want you to know this morning that God loves you with an incredible love. And if you're his child, if you've accepted his forgiveness, if you're like the rebellious son, if you've come by faith to God and said, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I understand that I've broken your ways like every other human being. But I believe that you did give your son Jesus as a solution for my sin. I believe he was God and man come to meet my greatest need. I believe that he died on the cross for me and that he rose from the dead. I believe that he paid for my sin. And based on that, I want you to forgive me. And I want you to enter my life. And I want my life to belong to you. I want the forgiveness and the mercy that you provide. And if you've done that, if you've accepted his grace and his forgiveness, you are a picture of that rebellious son who has come home to the Father. And I want you to see that that's your identity. That's who you are. You are a child of God. God who is rich in mercy has declared you to be alive. He's raised you up. He's seated you in heavenly places. He calls you his son. He calls you his daughter. And he wants you to know his forgiveness and his grace. How you define yourself will change the way that you live. You are in an incredible place because while you're here at camp, you have the opportunity to be away from the distractions of everyday life. You're away from your phone. Some of you are going through withdrawal. How many of you just started working your thumbs even though there was no phone there? <laughs> right? Anybody? All right. If it hasn't kicked in, it will. 
You're away from Facebook. You're away from some of your, your friends. And while you're here in this place, I want to challenge you. Use this time. Don't waste this time. God's brought you here for a purpose. Whether you're a returning camper or a brand new camper, you're here, yes, to improve musically, to grow musically, to meet friends, and those are important things. But I believe God's brought you here to take you to a new level in your relationship with Him. And that begins by seeing God for who He is and your life as He sees it. And how you define yourself will change the way that you live. You have a new identity in Christ. He's put that robe on you. He's put that ring on you. You have authority to do His will, to accomplish His purposes in your life. And you have ability and purpose and a great plan for your life. And so I want to challenge you. Use this time. Make your prayer this morning. Say, God, while I'm here at camp, whether I'm here for one week or five weeks, God, would you reveal yourself to me in a fresh and new way? Help me to see you for who you are. Help me to see my life as you see it. Because I believe when you do that, it will change everything. Let me pray for you. Father, this morning, I thank you for... Uh, the privilege and the opportunity to be back in this place. I thank you for each, each student that's here, each counselor, each faculty member. And God, I pray that, that throughout this week and throughout this summer, God, that you would work in our lives in such a way that we see you for who you are, that we see our lives the way that you see them. And God, I, I pray that as we do that, it would change the way that we live. I pray that you'd help every person here today to define themselves first and foremost as a follower of Christ, as a child of God, and, Lord, that it would change the way that we live. Father, we love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.